Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Haider. As you know, in this program, we discuss a range of issues. Uh, you also know that the platform for this program is the Center for Security, Strategy, and Policy Research, uh, and CESPA uh, is a think tank, a policy research uh, center housed in the University of Lahore. We've been doing these programs uh, before. Also, this program is also part of our effort to put out discussions on issues of security, foreign policy, especially issues that are of concern to Pakistan. Uh, today's episode, we have with us Ambassador Robin Raffel. Uh, let me introduce her uh, to you. Uh, Ambassador Raffel is an old Pakistan and South Asia hand. Uh, she has many friends here and knows the lay of the land uh, very well. And uh, she is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a senior non-resident associate of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Raffel was a career U.S. Foreign Service officer. Before that, she also served at the CIA as an analyst. As a Foreign Service officer, she worked for nearly 40 years in foreign affairs agencies, including the U.S. Department of State, U.S. Agency for International Development and U.S. Department of Defense. She has served as Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, Ambassador to Tunisia, Vice President of the U.S. National Defense University, and Deputy Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. She managed the development assistant to assistance to Pakistan under the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook. Uh, earlier in her career, she served in Pakistan, India, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. And interestingly, she also at one point taught history at Damawand Women's College in Iran. So we're going to have this discussion with Ambassador Raffel. As I said to you, Ambassador Robin Raffel is with us. Robin, thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you back in Lahore and also at the University of Lahore, where you just delivered a, a scintillating talk uh, covering a broad range of US Pakistan issues. So let me uh, take the cue from that and start with what President Biden said a few days ago. <laughs> I can see you smiling and which then got Pakistan to issue a demarche. Um, and to be precise, and interestingly, uh, he was talking about Xi Jinping. And he was talking about the fact that he's traveled like 17,000 miles with this guy. And then he says, this is a guy who understands what he wants, but has an enormous, enormous array of problems. We'll get to that. But how do we handle that? How do we handle that relative to what's going on in Russia? And what I think is maybe one of the most dangerous nations in the world. And suddenly, it's, it's almost like, he is jaywalking into this. Pakistan, nuclear weapons without any cohesion. So my question is that when you're talking to the students and the faculty, you talked about the fact that there is now a sense in, in uh, Washington that uh, US-Pakistan relations need a reset. This doesn't look like that. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that it, that it doesn't, but let me say a couple of things. You know, first of all, a disclaimer, I, you know, I don't know who wrote the president's speech, what their motive was, and so on and so forth. But this was a political rally, essentially, right. of the Democratic Party. Yeah. And it looked to me a bit like a throwback to, um, you know, previous times when, uh, you know, during, during the Afghan war, when Ambassador Holbrook first uh, came into office, the idea was that Pakistan was more important than Afghanistan, and the idea that it was a dangerous place, which it was much more dangerous then than it, than it is now, with terrorism and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I remember when I was there, the TTP were in the Swat Valley, and everybody was saying they were 90 miles from, 60 miles from the capital. So, uh, there was that sense then uh, of concern uh, that um, things could get out of control. And then one of the first things that comes to the American mind, and I'm sure Pakistan military's mind is, whoa, 
uh, let's make sure our, our weapons are, are secure. So I think it was kind of a throwback to that. I don't think that there's been any new study that has concluded uh, that Pakistan's weapons are vulnerable. You know, I, I really don't. I think it was just one of those things in a political moment. And as you say, the association with Xi Jinping and China and so on. So I, you know, I frankly, you know, I don't mean to speak for the president, but I, I don't think he meant anything urgent and contemporary by it. Right. So, you know, I, I was reading it and it seems to me that he was ad-libbing. Uh, if you look at the transcript, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like a prepared speech. Right. But, you know, from our perspective in Pakistan, and I, I perfectly understand the point that you're making, and there's a sort of institutional memory also. Mm -hmm. uh, but when this remark comes with reference to Pakistan, a few months after India launches accidentally a cruise missile, <laughs> which, which falls into Pakistani territory, then we are likely to say, oh, whoa, hold on. What's going on here? I, I think that's fair enough. And, you know, uh, it won't surprise you to hear me say that uh, because of the strategic nature of our growing relationship with India, uh, we cut them more slack, <laughs> you know, um, than we might other countries. So uh, that by way of saying why there wasn't a public outcry over that incident, um, you know, which wasn't intentional as far as we all know and so on and so forth. So drawing attention to it really uh, would, would be not productive. Um, but I would just reiterate, I don't think there is a current concern about the safety of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Right. But uh, I don't want to belabor this point, but uh, let's subtract Pakistan from this equation. And uh, purely in technical terms, uh, when something like this happens between a nuclear dyad, uh, a cruise missile launch, accidental, mm -hmm. unintentional, uh, it would surely ruffle some feathers in Washington with reference to the, the protocols and procedures uh, and the rest of it. So do you think uh, maybe uh, there's a sort of private channel to India saying, you know, the Americans asking, hey, what happened? How did, how did it happen? I can only assume so. I I'm asking you, of so. course, I'm, I'm not asking you to speculate, <laughs> but given your experience yeah. as a career yes. foreign service officer. Exactly. There would be, uh, there would be certainly, particularly starting in military channels, you know, a, a genuine question for, can you explain what happened here? Um, right. uh, and we would expect an explanation. Right. Um, Okay, so, you know, when before this interview, we were WhatsApping and I yeah. said to you, you know, we're going to talk about some of these triangles. Mm -hmm. So since India has come up, let me ask you, uh, you mentioned during your talk that there is a, a sense of rising concern in the U.S., uh, not just uh, in the think tanks, but also, you know, the State Department and about some of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's policies, uh, not just internal policies, but this kind of sense of communalism, uh, some legislation that targets minorities, uh, and also certain other practices that are not strictly democratic in terms of, you know, suppressing dissent within India, uh, and the unilateral decision to revoke uh, the special status of uh, occupied Kashmir. Uh, so how would you rate that in terms of juxtaposing it with the, the compulsions of realpolitik and a strategic partnership and these concerns? Look, you know, uh, I, what I would say at this point mm -hmm. is realpolitik is probably a little bit ahead. 
you know, what I, what I wanted to make clear, though, is that the U.S. is not tone deaf to these, uh, you know, these various events in India and the growing repression. I don't think it's clear to the U.S. how, what's the most effective way to respond to that. Okay. You know, it's, it's difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I have to say when, when the U.S., for example, complains to Pakistan about why they don't criticize the Chinese mm-hmm. about their treatment of the Uyghurs, you know, to my mind, <laughs> a good response to that is, well, and, and it's a response that Pakistan has made, you know, there, there are uh, countries that you, America, don't criticize. We all only criticize the people we can afford to criticize and afford to offend, and those that we we um, don't wish to offend, we handle things quietly. Everybody responds that way, I think. Right. You know, I, I'm happy to talk about the Uyghur issue. Uh, it surprises me why Pakistan has not really been able to make the case the way it should have made the case. Because there is a very simple principle of Pakistan foreign policy, which is that we do not interfere in the internal affairs of another country. Now. Uh, we talk about occupied Kashmir because we consider it disputed territory. Mm-hmm. But we've never spoken about what happens in Northeast or what happens in the Red Corridor because that's Indian territory. Right. You know, so I think this is something, I mean, we should have been able to make the case better than we, we have managed to do that. Now, uh, you also talked about this, and of course, a number of analysts in the Beltway have recently spoken about this, that India does not really want to get into the U.S. camp. So they they want to retain their autonomy, uh, their pattern of voting or non-voting or abstention uh, in relation to Russia, the case in point, Mm -hmm. uh, their uh, purchases of uh, oil and gas, oil particularly from Russia. Uh, is this something that bothers policymakers uh, in Washington in terms of some kind of reevaluation of whether, you know, especially if you look at Quad and slash AUKUS, mm. even though India is not part of AUKUS, right. but uh, how does Washington look at this? Well, I think there's there's no doubt that it's irritating, you know, because the the Russia story is very fast moving, and you know it's it's difficult to sort of gauge, you know how uh, aggressive you're going to be to try and get people on your side and so on and so forth. So it's 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 no doubt difficult. I think it is uh, hard for the U.S. that, as I mentioned in my talk, that uh, the Indian Foreign Minister has become the most articulate spokesman for the global South on this issue. Um, and I think it's in, in part irritating because he does make a very good case from, from their point of view, you know, and from India's point of view. Um, now, I think the U.S. has, uh, from the time of the first resolution in March, where the vote was 141-4, and this one where it was 143, not a huge gain, but I think the U.S. realized the first time because of the, uh, you know, freshness of, and horror of the invasion and uh, and so on and so forth of uh, Ukraine, there was kind of a, a throwback to you're with us or against us um, in in trying to mm-hmm. to get uh, votes for that resolution. And I think they well, realized... Almost the same kind of binary as in the case of Iraq. Right. And, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, wiser heads have prevailed, and you know there was a different approach. Unfortunately, uh, you know from the U.S. perspective, it didn't change the voting that much. Um, and you know I sort of expected that it might because the Russian um, uh, you know behavior has become more and more egregious. Mm-hmm. But w- the argument uh, from Jai Shankar and others is really all the more reason to get negotiations going. I mean, they don't say, oh, Russia can do what it's, it wants, or Russia was in, within its right, or anything like that. They say, you know, you, you've got to negotiate 
an end to this war. And, and you know, the other Indian point is they want to multipolar the world. And from their point of view, you can understand that. And I think it is a reality. And I, I don't think the U.S. wants a, you know, the U.S. is not fooling itself, especially in its recognition of the, the what I'd call the peerness of the competition mm -hmm. with China. I mean, you know, we've not faced someone, uh, you know, a, a, a challenge um, where someone really had similar economic power and growing military power and so on. I, I, I don't want to say exactly equals, but we're beginning to realize, whoa, this is a, um, a real competition. That's actually, that's actually clear from the recent national security mm. strategy, which, which was put out by uh, Jake Sullivan. Uh, the U.S. does realize that right now Russia is an immediate threat right. of, a, of a different nature right? because there's a war going on. But broadly speaking, in terms of the various elements of national power and their synergy, right. China is the real peer competitor. Right. Now, the issue is that, uh, you know, you made a, a very interesting point uh, during your talk that in, in, from the 80s onwards, or from, well, actually 70s onwards, uh, when we opened up China right. to the U.S., uh, right up to the 90s, uh, our relationship with China did not bother the U.S. Beyond the 90s. Be didn't. Beyond the 90s yeah. also. But it has now begun to bother the U.S. Now, we say that we don't want to be in any camp. Right. And officially, the U.S. also says, we are not saying that you should be either in this camp or that camp. Yeah. But indirectly, because of this peer competition, for instance, the manner in which the U.S. legislation is now trying to kneecap, uh, if you will, the Chinese tech industry, yeah. the artificial intelligence, the rest of it. It also impacts us in the sense that if, for example, if I'm going to simply use a Huawei equipment, then I could indirectly become a victim of those sanctions yeah. because of that legislation. Yeah. So in a way, the U.S. is saying, well, you guys have to choose. I mean, not just to us, but to a number right. of other state actors or, or non-state actors in terms of corporations and companies. Is this something which is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of the, the peer competition or what? Ms. Shima once called the tragedy of great power politics. Well, I hope not. I mean, I you know, U.S. sanctions, you know, have a troublesome history, and I think the wisest thing to say about sanctions is that they're great until you have to implement them. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, so, but the U.S. Congress is, is still is very keen on the sanctions instrument, and you know, I think. Um, you know, it's not that there isn't awareness of the long reach, uh, legal reach mm -hmm. of U.S. sanctions, but it, you know, it's kind of a bridge too far to tailor them, and you know, it it becomes. Uh, but the U.S. has become complicated. Great at doing that. I mean, yeah. they, for instance, they are now targeting the Chinese chip industry. Right. Right. So this is essentially this is like throwing sand in the gears in the sense that you know, okay. We are going to go there, but we'll make sure that you stay here. So they have asked the Taiwanese and the South Koreans, and they're saying, you're not going to sell the chips sell, to, uh, yeah. to China. Yeah. And interestingly, Chinese get their chips from Taiwan. Yeah. I mean, when, oh, Na yeah. Everybody when, does. When, <laughs> when, when Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan and the Chinese put some sanctions on sand for construction yeah. and, you know, some types of fish. They did not touch the the real jewel of Taiwanese export, which is the chip, yeah. because that's like shooting yourself Self in the, in the foot. foot. And they're smarter than that, yes. And they're smarter than that. Um, but here's the issue. President Biden, and rightly so, uh, has also uh, tried to put the climate challenge on the international agenda. Yeah. Um, now, this is a challenge which is 
scientific, the science is now very clear about it. The politics is messy, but yeah, the science of science it is, is very clear. clear. I totally agree. Now, when you have peer competition at one end, and you also need cooperation because no one state, no matter how powerful and resourceful, can handle this alone. It has to be a global effort. So how does one square the old Macht and Realpolitik with the new global climate challenge? You know, that is uh, the issue that everyone who has read that strategy is asking about. That is the fundamental contradiction. And, you know, I, I think what the U.S. is trying to say is, number one, look, we realize these are, you know, uh, opposing goals here, but we still have to try and, uh, and deal with both. Um, and I think part of the, part of the issue with China too, in terms of the effort to, um, to compete and, you know, maybe blunt some of their progress, mm -hmm is a realization that the U.S. can no longer go around to countries like Pakistan or Sri Lanka or whoever and lecture them about going into debt with the Chinese and about, you know, whether it's CPAC or Hamatota Port or whatever. I think there's a realization that that's not going to work. Even uh, with uh, Huawei, you know, uh, saying you can't use that technology. There's a realization that the U.S. has to figure out how to offer some attractive um, uh, alternatives or, or additional um, uh, carrots to, to these countries. And, you know, part of what that strategy is about, as you noticed, is sort of rebooting inside America, uh, manufacturing, infrastructure, you know, uh, Supply, chain. uh, supply chains and, and all the rest. Mm -hmm. So that the idea is, in part, look to ourselves. What is our comparative advantage? You know, uh, and how can we offer solutions to the problems of countries that have just sort of automatically turned to China because China has a checkbook and builds infrastructure? So we're really trying to take on that challenge, I think, of figuring out what is what is our comparative advantage? You know, what are our own strengths uh, that we can put on the table? That's an interesting point because it appears that the idea, the neoliberal idea of globalization, is almost perhaps on a ventilator now because, and it's it's kind of moved to what Lutwak called geoeconomics. Uh, back in the in the 1990s in fact let me just quote from just a just a line from uh, what he wrote in that uh, that article for the national interest uh, this neologism geoeconomics is the best term i can think of to describe the admixture of the logic of conflict with the methods of commerce and it, it's expression in the sense yeah. that uh, the us sanctions regime is precisely that you get the allies you're trading among the allies, but you, you're also now targeting, for instance, the immediate target being Russia, throwing them out of SWIFT, throwing yeah. them, you know, and, and putting sanctions and the rest of it. Um, so do you think this is just a moment or this is going to become an episode? You know, it's a very good question to which I don't know the answer. But uh, what it might become... Um, more than, uh, you know, more than a moment, but I hope it doesn't become a series, you know, <laughs> uh, because I think ultimately, you know, again, sanctions, once you apply them, you know, have, have effects that you, d you didn't think about. And also, I mean, the obvious point um, with Russia, Ukraine is what's happening with global food supply, what's happening with global oil markets, you know, all sorts of secondary and tertiary effects that we might have sort of thought of, but in the urgency of the moment, sort of pushed to the side. Um, and, you know, uh, as everyone knows, a large part of the Global South uh, resistance to um, the U.S. and West's approach on Russia and Ukraine is, is the side effects for them. 
and their economies. And in their calculus, you know, this isn't worth it. <laughs> you know, right. uh, putting down Russia isn't worth it. You know, uh, so get to the negotiate negotiating table and let you know normal uh, exports continue. Right. Uh, you know, since the Nixon shock and the dollarization right. of the the global economy, uh, that is basically the reason, if you will, of how and why the U.S sanctions can become so effective. Yeah. You know, so there has been a lot of talk about de-dollarization uh, simply because the U.S. has weaponized the dollar. Right. Do you think that now we, if we take the Russian case, uh, their economy has taken a hit, but at the same time, uh, they haven't crumbled and, and you know, they are now selling to people and they're using sort of circuitous ways of getting things done. Uh, Iran has also done that. Yes. Uh, North Korea, of course, has kind of joined at the hip yeah. with China. So that's a different case altogether. But do you think this is likely to expedite this, this talk about somehow finding an alternative to the US dominated financial system of the world? I'm sure it will. Now, that being said, I think it will take a lot longer That's than right. many people think, and that in that time span, uh, it would be possible for the U.S. to, you know, re-jigger uh, its its approaches on this a bit to retain the the prominence of the dollar. Yeah, I think that that right. would be important. But, but you know, barter arrangements and all that Russia is doing um, is natural and you you do hear much more chatter about this from China, Russia and lots of countries. Well, China is not entirely happy with what Russia has been doing, but the Chinese are very smart and, and they're still playing the game according to the existing rules, whereas Russia has you know, sort of isolated yes. itself in a, in, a, in a massive way. Uh, but since we are in that part of the world, uh, before I sort of backpedal to Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Kissinger uh, was bitterly criticized by the Ukrainians and uh, by various other people uh, for saying that at the end of the day, you know, where do you want? Elbe was the lion. Now, is it going to be uh, the lion is going to be the you know, Donbass yeah. region, the, the Dnipro? Uh, so the Ukrainians are in no mood to listen to any talk about negotiations and and it, Rightly so, you know, if one from looks at it view, from their absolutely. point of view, rightly so. Having said that, Russia cannot afford to lose, or let me put it like this, Putin cannot afford to lose, because if he loses this conventional uh, war, uh, he loses personally, and Russia's world position is lost. Do you think that's uh, a point important enough for the US-led coalition, NATO and Ukraine itself to consider in terms of, uh, I will put it like, like, you know, essentially the, where is the culmination point of victory or what would be considered victory in a sense which can allow Ukraine to retain uh, what it has got, and Russia perhaps to retain what it has got. Look, it's it's obviously a very difficult question, um, and you know the history of Ukraine and the history of the boundaries, uh, you know, uh, or the messy. international borders. It's all very messy, yes, um, and I think you know the pro the problem, you know, quite frankly, is we all should have thought of that before this started. I mean, you know. And once things get started, it becomes very difficult. And as you say, the Ukrainians are in no, no mood, um, you know, to be talking negotiations or compromise or anything. But I think at some point, everybody's got to compromise. You know, I mean, uh, the, the return to a mid 20th century style of war yeah. is appalling. And, you know, 
in that sense, Kissinger, who's a wise old bird. Oh, yeah, that he certainly is. <laughs> yeah. And he hasn't backed off That's right. an inch. He, he's got a point. Yeah. And, you know, I would also say, though, that Russia's finished, not finished, Russia, Russia's stature on the global stage is already diminished. Yes. Putin's is already diminished. You know, so... But that, sorry, I'm cutting into what you're saying, <laughs> no, but, so what's the point but, but, but you know, historically speaking, uh, those are the inflection points because one realizes when one is winning, and in some ways the Ukrainian counteroffensives have taken the Russian yeah. by surprise. Yeah. Um, and you get the sense that the iron is hot, and so this is the time for me to act when precisely at that moment you should have thought otherwise so it's a it's a it's a yes. very uh, yes. delicate balance yes. you think you should continue yeah. the offensive until the yeah. end but actually you've got them on the run yeah. so it's time to negotiate i associate with the latter school myself i you know i i think you know when people have said of the united states you and the united states has said you know we're not going to tell the ukrainians when to negotiate I absolutely agree with that. I think we should be finding ways to help the Russians realize it's time for them to negotiate. Um, and I, I think at this point, very much the Russian side has to come first. Um, but I think there needs to be the most aggressive possible diplomacy with the Russians from whatever side has any standing uh, to try and bring that about. Right. Let's fly back to this region uh, quickly. Um, you, you've dealt with Afghanistan. Um, and you mentioned in your talk uh, that uh, the U.S. did not listen to Pakistan's advice. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Lakhdar Brahimi in a later interview actually said, he talked about it as the original sin, not getting the Taliban into right. the bond process. Um, now, of course, the Taliban are back. And frankly, we are also stuck with them, just like you are. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a situation which provides another point of convergence yep. uh, in a very ironic sort yeah. of twist of things. Is that an area where you think U.S. and Pakistan are talking and where they are cooperating? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I think absolutely so. I think they're cooperating on the counterterrorism side for certain. Uh, I know that the, the U.S. negotiator, who's a very able fellow, Tom West, uh, has visited here a lot. I think, you know, in his own mind, his thinking is a bit ahead of the administration um, in terms of what we should be doing. And I think he's right. You know, I mentioned quite forthrightly in my talk, the U.S. should have an office. They should have had an office two weeks after the evacuation and been challenging the Taliban, you know, on a daily basis. It's good basis. that they're talking to yeah. the Taliban. Yeah. I mean... Yes. So, so we are also involved in that process, but there's, right, a, there's but a direct bilateral... Absolutely, general. but it's in Doha. It's in Doha. It's in Doha. Right. So it's better to have it in Kabul. You need it in Kabul. And, you know, you talk to people who have dispassionate conversations in, uh, in Kabul and around Afghanistan today. You know, the Taliban leadership, the ministers, they know things are a mess. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they want to figure out ways to get technocrats back to help them. Uh, they know they need a constitution. They know that, that they, they look ridiculous in the eyes of the world over girls' education. And my contention is that by ice, pretty much isolating Afghanistan proper, it has the absolute opposite effect uh, in terms of, of moderating Taliban policies. Now, there are people who say, you know, it's just like the 1990s, they'll never change. I'm not at all persuaded, especially given the younger generation. That's right. A and their change. time is coming. You know, people don't live forever. That's right. Um, and, 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 you know, that's a very smart point because, because 20 years, the U.S. might not have been able to achieve 
its strategic objective of nation building, which if you ask me was, you know, from the get go, neither here nor yeah. there. But there has been an impact, especially in the cities. Sure. Where you now have a generation which is digital, which is connected, which has aspirations. In the 90s, women could not even think of coming out in the yeah. streets and actually saying we've got rights. Yeah. But they're doing that they're now. They're doing that. And look at your students here. I mean. Yes. The, the Afghan students yeah. here at UOL, uh, they, are, they all aspire for a better future. So you think that constant engagement with them will help or because there is a counter to that also and let me <laughs> present that counter that if we jump ahead of the curve in terms of engaging with them or providing them monies and the rest of it that they will have no incentive to actually move towards the direction that the world wants them to go um I'm the, the former in the sense of okay. I advocate engagement. Um, you know, and you're right that a lot of people think the opposite. They'll get fat and happy. Um, I don't, you know, I, I certainly advocate not showering them with money. You know, we did that for 20 years and ended up with the government was so corrupt it had no credibility and it ran away yeah. to be blunt. Right. So that didn't work. Thirty-seven billion dollars on ANDSF. Yeah, we just went up and smoke. Yeah, because we couldn't see what was actually going on. But but here's the thing, Rob. I mean, the cigar reports. You know, when Kabul fell, I was I was on one of those yeah. virtual programs because you know the COVID thing and all. And so some of the U.S. experts were talking about the speed with which this had happened, and. and I was flummoxed because I asked them, I said, look, were you guys reading the cigar reports? Because what has happened, I mean, those reports were prescient in the sense that this is exactly what was likely to happen if things did not change. But let's go further east because we are coming uh, to the end of this uh, program also. Uh, Moid Yusuf wrote this excellent book on brokered bargaining. Uh, the nuclear dyad where the US in terms of Cargill and O102 and you know, the Twin Peaks yeah. and then uh, Bombay also uh, was there to broker and they were reaching out yeah. privately to Islamabad also to Delhi also. Right. But when this Balakot bombing happened, the US kept quiet. This was mm -hmm. under President Trump. Right. But when we decided that we are going to now respond to this aggression, the phone started ringing and they won't stop ringing. Uh, do you believe, given Narendra Modi's aggressive policy, given that these are two nuclear weapon states, given that Pakistan has a policy of what they call quid pro quo plus, given all this, uh, and let me also add another factor, given the Mr. Modi's penchant of using this kind of thing for domestic political purposes, uh, do you think that uh, US needs to be more engaged and not just in terms of crisis management at the time that there is a crisis, but also in terms of some kind of crisis resolution? Or some sort of, you yeah, know. I mean, first of all, you know, your phones were ringing off the hook here. I would assume a call or two was made on the other side as well. I don't know, but I, you know, I can assure you, if I were an officer in the embassy in New Delhi, in the American embassy, you know, I would uh, be inquiring as to, you know, what was that all about? So I think there was some of that. Um, I mean, I'm assuming there really was. Uh, I think the U.S. is very sensitive to keeping those sorts of things quiet on the Indian end because, you know, while nobody likes being lectured to or questioned about these sorts of things, the Indians do have a way of making it very painful. That's right. <laughs> very That's painful. Right. In Pakistan, you're a little more polite. 
you know, <laughs> in India, not. So that, you know, uh, that sort of conditions Americans and, and others as to, you know, how they respond in public. No, I, I, I get that. But let me replay this scenario. So assuming that the Indian missiles had actually hit those, uh, those buildings and 200 or over 200 students there yeah. would have been killed, that would have put the kind of pressure on Pakistan where then instead of responding by locking on to the targets but actually firing the missiles to one side, Instead of that, we would have taken out those targets, which then would have created its own spiral. Right. So we're talking about, I mean, it was pure chance that the Indians missed, missed, their, the target. missed the target. But if there are the next time, they may not miss the target. Right. In which case, Pakistan's response is going to be completely different from right. what it was. Right. You know, not just showing resolve. Yeah, but uh, actually acting. Right. Acting. So I think that's a dangerous scenario. It is a dangerous scenario. And I think in that case, you know, if if the Indian missiles had actually hit a target, you would have had, you know, a very strong response on the U.S. side, which would have been critical of India and saying to Pakistan, don't take this any mm. further. You know, but don't then, get don't then, get in a tit for tat. And yeah. then there would have had to be further diplomacy and negotiations or whatever, but just to quickly call the Indians to account and quickly say to Pakistan, don't respond and we'll live to fight another day here, I think would have been what happened on the U.S. side, what the U.S. would have done. I agree with you, but uh, uh, frankly, uh, if that happens, we are on a very slippery slope. And right. And I know that I'm sure that Pakistan would be on a very short leash in terms of yes. uh, restraining itself. Um, so I think, you know, I think the U.S. is aware of that. Um, as I say, the U.S. treads very carefully with the Indians, you know, because in part because, as I say, they cause a lot of pain if you uh, um, criticize them in the slightest, <laughs> very thin skinned, uh, but also because we're trying, you know, in this it's one of the many contradictions in our national That's security right. strategy. That's so right. we're trying to kind of have it both ways. But, you know, I'm confident if push were to come to shove and there were a, a real life crisis, we, you know, even though we say, oh, you know, you're going to have to sort those things out yourselves. You know, we're not going to come to anybody's rescue in South Asia anymore. You've heard that line. I don't yes. believe it. I think we'd be front and center. Absolutely. There's a lot of other stuff that we could talk about. But thank you so much, Ambassador Robin Raffel, for being with me and being at the University of Lahore. My pleasure indeed. Great having you. My pleasure. Thank you.